so I am so pleased to have the opportunity to tell you why Nancy Lyons is speaking to you tonight. And some of you already know how um, she leads with her heart. She brings her strengths to the world in a really generous way. Um, but she has really shown up for me and for this group in ways that are beyond my wildest expectations. We had her as our keynote speaker at our first Lean In Together conference many years ago. At some point, she wrote this great recommendation for me that I am still blown away from, and I'm not kidding, Nancy, and that's kind of why we're doing next month on recommendations, because you wrote <laughs> that recommendation when, like, I feel like you didn't know me, but it was like, here's what I see, and I want that to happen for other people. And at some point, you sent me an email saying that you admired the heck out of me, and <laughs> it got seared into my mind that, guess what, we admire the heck out of each other. And, <laughs> um, and at some big group, you said, you know, basically, I will meet with you if you need. I mean, this was a while ago, so I'm definitely not going to hold you to it. But it's like on the pantheon of generosity, like Rigoberta Menchu is on that list. Like these people who have publicly, um, the CEO of Turk is on that list, people who have just been incredibly publicly generous. So those are some of the reasons I, I wanted to uh, make sure that this community got the benefit of your thinking, you know, every seven years or so. So it's really, we really appreciate you coming. And um, I think that's it. You have charisma. I trust you. Every time I hear you talk, I just get a lot from it. So the floor is yours. If you want questions, we got them. So 20, 30 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Linda. I, I, first of all, I just want to say thank you to you um, for uh, inviting me tonight. Um, I. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting. Um, I just saw Trista Harris is in this group. Um, you know, those those of you who have written a book, I, 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 it's a really vulnerable thing. And I don't know that people realize that. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I imagine that Glennon Doyle um, also struggles with, um, you know, just sort of putting your thinking out there and hoping that people embrace it. Um, so the thing that I'm really grateful for is that I said, I wrote a book and I'm a little nervous about it. And you said, come and talk about it. And, um, so I, I'm really grateful for your support and your willingness to include me in, um, tonight's conversation. Um, and thank you to all of you for, um, showing up. I hope, uh, I don't cause you to ghost to, you know, suddenly just, oh, have internet problems. Um, <laughs> and disappear. You know, it could happen. Um, so I hope that uh, I hope that this is enjoyable for everybody. Um, I do have a dog behind me um, who is known to bark on occasion, and I apologize in advance for that. Um, working at home is weird. Um, also, I'm not wearing presentable pants, so I'm not standing up. Um, and uh, speaking, you know, I get a lot of joy from speaking to folks. I it's like what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a motivational speaker. I've been heading to it forever. I'll probably be dead when I hit my career goals, but whatever. Um, I really like it because I like the energy that I get from people. So Zoom is really weird for me. And um, I, I like seeing your faces. I'm open to, you know, you throwing questions at me or interrupting or whatever you need to do, because that's really where I, I um, find the most joy in this whole process. So don't worry, throw your hands up, interrupt me, whatever you want to do. I wrote a book and I'm going to share a, a couple of slides with you just to give you an overview of um, that. Let's see here. I'm just going to do this and then I'll just open it right up. So if I go up to here, so, um, so there you go. So this is, this is who I am. Um, and only very recently have I found um, enough comfort uh, and confidence in my own work to actually call myself a culture advocate. I've been talking about culture for a really long time. And I finally just put my arms around it and said, you know, I, I, I've done this enough. And just to give you a little background, I worked in the digital space forever and worked on user and customer experiences for a very long time with large corporate entities. And I think I started talking about culture because the internet changed who we are. It changed how we operate, how we communicate, how we connect, how we fall in love with each other. It changed so much about our behaviors and we very rarely talk about that. And it changed 
what culture is in the workplace. And so um, I started writing and talking about it a really long time ago. And the, that, that internet thinking changed us and I started talking about that change. So I really talk a lot about the intersection, uh, you know, the intersections of, um, you know, people and teams and technology and process and culture. And culture really comes down to how you feel about being in a place, right? Like, is it, it I think that when a culture is really good in a workplace, it's a palpable energy, you feel it, when you walk through the door, when, you know, these days when you log in. So, um, so this is who I am. And I actually publish a newsletter every month. And if you're interested, you can check it out at nancylyons.com. Um, the book is, was a really strange thing. And tonight I'm just going to tell you about my journey to the book and then some key messages in the book, if that's okay with you. If you want to hear something else like embarrassing stories, I'm open to that too. And I have dozens, literally dozens. Th that sounds um, good. So just say the word <laughs> if this is boring and you want me to go down embarrassment road because I can do that. Um, you know, as I, I, I realize as a person who consumes business books and self-help books that every book that's written is written for a leader, a manager, a business owner, a boss, but very few books take into account that we are all bosses. We are all leading or expected to lead in some way. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of the work that, you know, a lot of, a lot of what business books are saying speak to the way things have always been done. And I think we are sitting right now at this really interesting moment that requires a change mindset. And, you know, we're, we're living in disruption right now. So we've talked about it a lot. It's been a buzzword for a really long time. But the pandemic, I think, you know, there's, there's other sort of cultural awakenings happening right now that are causing us to really look at how we work, how we show up, who we are, the character that we, you know, that we possess, that we bring and demonstrate. And it occurred to me um, before, obviously, there was any pandemic, that we don't often just talk to each other. And that when these books are being written, we're not talking to people with jobs. We're talking, you know, and we have these crazy, glorious ideas about what success looks like. And for some people, success is really just doing good work. I know that was my idea of success. And it became something else when I realized that in order to operate in the business community, I had to have a title that resonated with people, that mattered to people. I had to, you know, I had to possess a certain confidence that people would react to. But the truth is, all I ever wanted for my life was to do good work. And that is enough. And I think that even at work, there is a you know, there are these um, chasms of status. Um, and, you know, there's, there are the bosses, the managers, the leaders, the executives, and there's everybody else. And yet it's the everybody else that determines how work feels. It's the energy from everybody. It's the commitment from everybody that really channels into that culture, what that culture feels like. And so I decided that I was going to write a missive for everybody that goes to work. And when I say go, I say it very metaphorically. I think we all think about 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or 5 a.m. or whatever. When you're, if you're Linda, it's 4 a.m. Whenever you start your work day, that's the going to work, right? So when I say go, I don't even mean... Um, you know, going to a physical place. And actually, I've received a lot of feedback from early readers of this book that say, this is a great book for a post-pandemic world. Um, and I want you to know that uh, I'm, my intention with this whole process is not necessarily to sell you this book. What I want to do is talk to you about my process um, in writing this book and the things I discovered. Whether or not the book resonates with you is neither here nor there. I'd like it. Let's, you know, I'd be lying if I said otherwise. But the truth is, if there's a book in you, if there's a story in, in you, if there's something that needs to be told or shared, if you have an aha, I just want you to know that the journey um, in terms of self-growth is super valuable. 
And I want to be somebody who validates that for you. So if at the end of this, you're going, I have something to say, I have something to do, I have a higher calling, and I, I, you know, I want to bounce it off somebody or somebody's to see if it makes sense, you know, reach out because I'm here for you. Because if not for some of the mentors and teachers I found along the way, I don't know that I would have been able to make this book take shape. So what I decided was I really wanted to write a book about how we all have the power to make work better. And we all um, have all of the tools that we already need, um, but it's about finding that power, acknowledging it, owning it, centering in it, and, and then deciding that you're, part, that you're accountable, that you are accountable for making work better. And even if you can't change massive organizations, you can change you, and you can influence the people around you and that can incrementally move in the direction you need to move in so i say this all the time you know work is sort of fundamentally broken i'm actually gonna not spend a lot of time on these slides i'm gonna get rid of the slides and i'm just gonna look at you but these are the things that you're gonna learn in this book um, i say that work is fundamentally broken because it is i think we abdicate responsibility for what work should feel like to leadership we want them to dictate what culture is, when in fact it's our responsibility. I think also that we, we abdicate a lot of our power to leadership because hierarchy is the way things have always been. And in the book, I talk mm -hmm. a lot about how work was built for the patriarchy. Work was built in a time that doesn't make sense anymore. And it's probably the last great sort of system of thinking and being and operating that needs to be disrupted and dismantled. I talk a lot about, um, you know, work was made for white men, right? Like that's sort of the reality. And right now is a moment in time when we can push back on how work works and really, I think, have an impact. So in this book, what I like to say to people is you're gonna learn how to overcome mental obstacles. So, you know, right now, upstairs in my house, on the dining room table is the final proof of this book. So the design, the cover is sitting here, half of it's sitting here, half of it's sitting, I can't look at it anymore, it's making me mental. But my spouse is going through it, and my spouse actually has not read it yet, and is saying to me, you know, this is, a, a really good book, but it's interesting because she also said, you are packing so much in it. There's so much in this book. And I agree that it's true. A lot of it is common sense. A lot of it you already know, but work has, you know, um, I don't wanna say it's beaten out of us, but it kinda has, you know, it kinda has. Like in some, in some ways we second guess ourselves you know, where fear has such a big, plays such a big role in how we show up at work. And so I think, you know, what I really want to do is help us get past that fear, those mental obstacles that create barriers for us and our success, and to practice better communication and really think about, oh, look, there's a typo. Awesome. Awesome. Um, if anybody would like to fill out the comment, the, the comment card after this presentation and let me know that I had a typo on a slide, that'd be great. Um, that's when you notice it, right? Right in the middle. Uh, and, and I think operationalizing empathy, like making empathy a value. Um, and then knowing, you know, when fear is the thing that's standing between you and success and learning how to communicate well and giving and receiving solid feedback. Like, I think we romanticize work. If I don't like my job, well, I'm going to look for something better. Not only am I going to look for something better, but I think that we sort of align success um, with our dream jobs and we all have them like our dream homes and our dream husbands. Don't we all have them? Like at one point in our lives, we thought, and I'm obvious, I obviously could care less about husbands. Let's be honest. I have a wife, but we all imagine the spouse that will save us from all things, the spouse that will, you know, make us whole and you're still picking up socks, right? You're still picking up socks. You still got to do laundry. I'm still walking the dog. Like nothing's perfect. And relationships take work and a lot of work. Like nobody tells you until you are actually married or in a long-term commitment that it is so much work. Sometimes you wonder if it's worth it. I mean, that's how I feel. You wonder some days, you know, and it doesn't matter if you married Prince Charming, you still wonder if it's worth, worth it. We don't talk about work that way. And yet work 
is layers of relationships. It's layers of relationships with other people and we don't have similar weighty conversations about the importance of nurturing mm -hmm. those relationships. So my goal in writing this is to encourage everybody to stop being a victim of work. You know, my job sucks. And Patty, Patty in, you know, in, in distribution, she's horrible. Patty is horrible. Is there a Patty in here? I apologize, Patty. Patty's horrible. And if it weren't for Patty, my job would be great. Like we want to blame it on the institution, blame it on the other people, blame it on the job itself. We have so many reasons for why work is impossible. And that's true for me too. And so what I really wanted to do was create a bit of a toolbox for people to lean on to stop being a victim of work and start being the boss of their mm -hmm. attitudes. And so work like a boss was an obvious title and it's just full of tough love. And it's full of tough love mostly, you know, I've owned a company for a long time, so I have been a boss, but I've also worked with large companies for a long time. So I have been in and witnessed how other bosses and other people operate inside of their organization. So a lot of this was built from observation, from engaging with organizations of a wide variety. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm just going to talk to you. My notes are here, so I apologize in advance. I'm going to look like I'm talking to somebody I like so much better, but it's not possible. Um, so I, uh, I think that work is broken. And what if we actually did things in thinking about work to improve ourselves. We talk a lot about wellness and we talk a lot about, you know, um, I really appreciated that, that breathing, um, you know, reminder at the beginning of this session. I think it's really important. What sorts of reminders do we need to get through a work day so that we are more functional in and around work? I think, um, I think as we think about, you know, leadership, um, being those folks that, fix things. I think we have to look at ourselves um, as having responsibility, but it's also going to make us happier and it's going to engage us further at work. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we also do because hierarchy was structured the way that it was because work was built for the patriarchy, we have sort of given up in a lot of ways, you know, right now, most of us have, higher ed degrees. Most of us, many of us go to work and we are peers and yet work isn't structured to acknowledge that kind of energy. And I really struggle with that. I struggle with the fact that we um, are subordinate to people that may not be as qualified as many of us. And if you're a woman, that's true a lot of the time, a lot of the time. And I don't know that we're having healthy conversations about how to get past that. And I also know, you know, because the majority of the people on this call are mothers, let's talk about motherhood. Part of it starts when we are young and in school, right? Like, I think we, te we are teaching our children how to be disempowered. Because what do we say, it, what, do we, what do we applaud in our children? We applaud shutting up, sitting down, getting in line, waiting your turn, keeping your mouth shut. And if you're a little girl, well, that's especially necessary. Don't make too much noise, don't be too big. And then mm -hmm. we get out of school, and I find this all the time, I see people come out of school and come into the workplace, and those of you who are more seasoned, you see this too, they come to work and do they know how to work? They don't. We aren't teaching people how to work and how to interact with each other and how to demonstrate value from day one. And we aren't teaching them what it feels like, you know, to really be a contributor from day one. We aren't, and they think they need permission, right? And what they need is safe spaces. We aren't creating the safe spaces in the workplace. And I am using that term, um, you know, really broadly, but safe spaces um, in the context of distributed workforces are possible and necessary. 
we're not seeing body you know bodily cues we're not seeing we're not we're not seeing body language so we have to be really intentional about creating those safe spaces and making room for ideas from all levels of the organization and i say this every time i talk to a group of women and i'll say it now you know it, women are the hardest women are the hardest and I, I wish I could apologize for it, but somebody needs to say it out loud. And so I do. I, the reason I own my own business is because of other women, because I didn't fit the mold, because I didn't show up the way I should as a, as a woman, because I didn't wear the right clothes, my butt was too big, you know, I had a big mouth. Um, I didn't, I, 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 I was so easy to judge. And judgment created barriers for me where I realized that I wasn't able to bring my best self to work because I wasn't able to show up like everybody else. And I, I, honestly, um, that um, like everybody else thing is part of what we're dealing with in a broader way culturally right now. If all I'm, I'm able to surround sorry. I'm sorry. With is other people like me, then I'm doing it wrong. And the opportunity for cultural contribution just doesn't exist. I don't want cultural fit. I want cultural contribution, but most organizations are looking for fit. And we don't have time for that anymore. I need people who don't look like me, who don't think like me, who don't move through the world like me, because I am delivering products and services that need to reflect the communities into which I'm delivering those products and services. So I need, you know, and that word diversity has us so confused. We shouldn't be thinking about diversity because that is something that HR owns and HR is just really thinking about the numbers. And I want the richness of cultural contribution in my workplaces. And if we don't create the safe spaces for them, we can't expect them to show up fully, wholly, so they can get their numbers. HR can get their numbers. But if we aren't cognizant about our responsibility and accountability for creating psychological safety, for making space, for centering anybody other than ourselves, if we don't make that space, we will never have our dreams come true with regard to the number. Well, sure, I just saw HR is such a joke sometimes. It's the only thing I saw. I couldn't agree more, and here's why. HR came about as a result of the Industrial Revolution and, and unions being formed to protect people from long, long hours, right? But it didn't take very long before HR became more about protecting the institution from litigation. So who's taking care of the people? And especially who is taking care of the people, if not each other? But we're all trained from a very young age. When we do start to learn about work, we learn from other workers about the way things have always been. And so we learn from a really young age in order to get ahead, I must sabotage the people around me. My kid goes to a Waldorf school. And one of the things that this Waldorf school teaches is the idea that we have become an individualistic society. We know how to take care of ourselves, how to think about ourselves, how to operate singularly, but we don't know how to open ourselves up to the bigger picture. We don't know how to be open to those people around us to truly collaborate. We don't know how to collaborate. We don't know how to combine you know, those interests and, and those creativities. And I wanted to address a lot of that in this book. Um, I think that accountability is a big theme through the book. I have to feel like, you know, every day, if I bring my negative energy, I am bringing a toxin to work. And I think making, you know, myself, like really tuning into and having self-awareness around that is so important. And so understanding the importance of personal accountability, instead of pushing off responsibility for how it feels, and we do it all the time, well, it's my boss. I can't make change. This company's too big. I'm just one person. My boss is horrible. And I think that's great, but then nothing happens. That might all be true, but nothing happens. And if you hate your job day in and day out, and you come to work every day hating your job, that toxin gets bigger and bigger, and eventually it infects the people around you. So really understanding that you 
are responsible and you have influence and you maybe you can't change an entire company but you can create a microculture and that microculture can influence the larger organization and when you start influencing from that place people will notice and change happens incrementally it doesn't happen in one fell swoop it happens incrementally and anybody can create it so if we see ourselves as agents of change who are accountable for those things we can actually influence our organizations for the better but the other thing that I'll say to you is you are all in this lean in certain these lean in circles because you're something because you're somebody's because you have power and big brains. So if you hate your jobs, get out, get out because I don't, we don't live in the time of my parents who worked a place for 30 years, whether they loved it or not, and saw it as drudgery and only did it to have a pension. That is not the time we live in anymore. And if you are living, if you are working in a place that you hate, regardless of what you try, you're a cancer now. And you're not doing them any favors either. They may not change for you, you may not change for them. Get out, I promise you, I promise you, that there are other opportunities out there. Now, I realize that I'm saying this at a moment when 30 million people are suddenly out of work and it's not looking promising, and yet, and yet the gig economy is still doing some amazing things and we were seeing unprecedented job, I said that word unprecedented, I'm sorry, I'll say pivot in a minute. We, are see we saw unprecedented job numbers just before this moment in time and we will see them again. We will see them again. We will get through this and we will see them again. So, so to believe that you are victimized and you have been captured by your job is taking away your own power and, and removing yourself, like taking yourself off the playing field for all opportunity. I also think fear, fear is something that I talk to women about all the time. Um, you know, I think men feel it, but they've been conditioned not to speak to it. Women feel it all the time and fear is our greatest motivator when it comes to decisions we make at work or around work or about work. And I think, you know, fear is the thing that made some of you tense up when I said, leave your job if you hate it. That was fear. That wasn't the truth. That wasn't your truth. It was your fear. Fear is that thing that makes us not want to look stupid in a meeting. I'm not going to actually contribute to this because I don't want to look dumb. I've done that a billion times. A billion times in my career. You know what else? We don't want to look too smart. You don't want to look too smart. If you're in a meeting full of men, you don't want to be the smart one because that could rock the boat a little bit, right? And any, most women have experienced that where you had to weigh the risk of being that woman in this meeting. So fear influences so much of what we do and it holds us back. And I see people all the time, afraid to speak up, afraid to try something new, afraid to succeed and afraid to fail. We are living in fear defined boxes and we are all guilty of it. It doesn't matter where you're at in your career. You could be a leader. You could be just starting out. We all know that little, that little demon that sits on our shoulder called fear. And we all know what it does to us in our worst moments. And there's not an easy way out of it, but acknowledging it and learning how to control it and identifying how fear plays a role in all of your decisions and how it shows up every single day. I had a moment last week with a gentleman who was furious with me, furious with me in the middle of a meeting because I said something like, well, I'm a woman. And I, I responded to an issue I tried to qualify it by saying I'm a woman and I responded to an issue in a really maternal way. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to say, I'm a woman. I'm probably thinking about this too soft. And he heard me saying, you are polarizing to him. You are polarizing and you are too harsh. And he got really mad at me. And, um, and I was trying to express my fear. I was trying to express my fear of how I would be interpreted and how I would show up. So I still haven't figured out wholly how to manage fear. Sometimes I think transparency is the way to go. And then a moment like that happens and I think, well, it doesn't matter what I do, you know, I still have to hide it. And sometimes that hiding it is part of the issue. I think, um, you know, the other thing, and this is where women, I think, were really hard for me, and I'm just challenging you all to 
to examine this in, in yourselves. I think um, women, I think it's important to create workspaces and to be part of, um, of fostering workspaces where you can fly your free flag. Because the weirder you are, probably the more creative you are. Um, I'm a weirdo. That's why I talk like this. That's why I move my hands all the time. That's why I tell you the truth about the fact that I'm not wearing presentable pants. There was a time in my career where simply by being myself, I was off-putting to other women, right? And yet we are all weirdos. I have a whole chapter in this book about being a weirdo. And quite frankly, if we made more space for weirdos at work, how wonderful would work be? But your weirdo actually just scares my weirdo. It's not that your weirdo is wrong, it's that it kind of freaks me out because it's not comfortable for me. Well, I think that is part of a broader theme too. We need to get past our need to be so comfortable. Our work will be better when we start to create and allow for discomfort. We have to move into the uncomfortable, move out of our comfort zones in order to make work better, make our relationships better, make our communities better, make our neighborhoods better, to be who we say we wanna be, exactly it's inclusion, exactly. I find myself talking about inclusion all the time and I am not qualified to do it. Just one other white lady talking about inclusion, right? But I do think that creating spaces where people feel that sense of belonging is on everyone. It's on everyone and we don't think about it actively enough. So I do think, you know, work, one of the points that I make in the book is that work is really the only true melting pot that we experience because in our lives, we sort of surround ourselves with people that we're comfortable with, right? And we, we marry somebody that fits real nice and doesn't challenge us too much until they grow up. And we, you know, we, we surround ourselves with people like us, but work, we don't have a lot of say in. So it really is a melting pot. And we really are challenged by the messiness of other humans that are sort of thrown together. And we have limited skills around tolerating it or accepting it or embracing it. In fact, we don't know how to embrace other people's weird at all. So we judge it because that makes us feel better. And judging is a weird thing, right? Like, we're always either feeling, trying to feel better than somebody or managing the fact that we feel worse than other people. We feel less than other people. Most of us move through the world in one space or another. It, 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 I feel better about me if I can, make, if I can somehow you know, craft this idea in my own head that you are less than me. Or I feel less than because I've made up the fact that you're better than me. And Comparison is the thief of joy. Somebody said that it wasn't me. I wish I would have. It's brilliant. It's true. It's hundred percent true. We compare ourselves to others. And so if we could remove judgment from the workplace and really allow our freak flags to show up wholly, work would be so much better. I think, you know, one of the things that I realized a long time ago is, I mean, think about this in your workplaces, in the work that you do, every single horrible problem comes down to communication which only goes to show you that it's communication with clients, it's communication with team maker, teammates, it's communication with teams, each other, bosses, managers, it's promises we've made, it's things we've poorly articulated. It very rarely comes down to a thing. Very rarely. It's almost always communication because we go to school and we're taught to shut up and sit down, not how to negotiate and communicate with each other. That was something that's been so true in my life that I wanted to write about it. And the other thing that I think we haven't been taught to do is give or receive feedback. Give or receive feedback. I am the first person to admit that I get defensive when you tell me that I've screwed up. Five more and minutes. What I've learned over time is to shut up sit, and sit with it. Five minutes, Nancy, keep going. Got it, thank you. Um, and then I think the last thing, the last you know, big thing that I try to drive home, and these are just sort of four or five of the points that I sort of came to and really wanted to write about and tried to pack in the book, but there's a lot in there, um, are caring and kindness. Um, you know, I published an article on LinkedIn today about the L word at work. Um, there's a woman that I met in doing all this work. Her name is Sagal Barsad. She's a professor at the Wharton School, and she's spent much of her career um, studying companionate love 
and what it means to actually bring love to work. And I think if we're going to look at HR again, I'm sure some of you actually work in HR and you're going to write me hate mail after this. That's cool. I can take it. But um, I think that we got rid of, you know, like the word love is something that's feared in the workplace. But I think, you know, we spend a lot of time saying, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, that's garbage because work sometimes sucks and it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how great your job is or how good you are at it. Like you can't make not work, not suck. You can't, right? You can have the best job in the world, make all the money and it still is going to suck someday. So why do we talk about it like that? I think if we love each other more at work, you know, we hear that if you have one best friend, if you have one best friend, you'll actually like your job more. Okay. But I think we can do better than that. I think we can cultivate real true relationships and know that there are people there that have our backs and really enjoy work more because we care, because we actually care. And again, I go back to, if you don't actually care, get out, get out. And don't believe that you don't have the power to make a choice like that. You do, we all do, we all do. So I'm gonna um, sort of end there. I have so much more. You could call me, we could do a big conference call. I'm done with Zoom though. Um, and uh, I have so much more that I could share with you, but I appreciate the time just being able to share this. My journey to that book was all sort of personal lessons. I did a ton of research and talked to some people and included some stories, um, but the sto it was just in me and it had to be written. And if you have a story that you need to tell, I encourage you to tell it and uh, and if I can, um, you know, help any of you in any way, please don't hesitate. The book can be found at worklikeaboss.com. Um, but if you try to share that on Facebook, apparently that is offensive language. So you have to say worklikeabossguide.com because Facebook decides what's okay and what isn't in the world. And um, I'm just wondering if any of you can call Cheryl and ask her if I can please publish worklikeaboss.com for the love of Jesus or whomever you're into. Thank you. <laughs> we'll make sure sure <laughs> that's great um so we are out of time uh i want i really do want people to get into small groups so uh nancy you have people's questions i'm going to pause the video